Joe Orth and I are starting a podcast. What should we call it? Mm. Hey, don't pick on me. You know why? Because this is why. Well, let's see what he says. The Joe Show. <laughs> Give Joe the business. That's right. Top of Joe. <laughs> oh, top of Joe. What is happening here? Would you listen? We'll give you a chance. Thank you. Uh... That's Joe. That's Rooster. And this is the Together We Shall podcast, episode 44 in 2024. What's happening, Hugs and I-5s hat-wearing man? Yeah, man. I'm sporting my new, my new garb that I got uh, a couple weeks ago down there in Baton Rouge. Yeah, I, I don't know if they say it like that, but it did. Yeah, I don't know. It felt right to me. I don't know. <laughs> What's going on, man? I tell you, it's been a, a good kickoff to the month. A lot of things happening. You get Arctic breezes, and now it's like so hot outside. I, I had to like, you know, get seventy degrees on the East Coast already. Um, crazy again. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Totally wearing shorts right now. Wildness. But you know, I'm sure. Just wait a while. I'm sure that'll change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, Would you? Uh, oh, go ahead. I had something, but go ahead. I just don't understand like weather. People always talk about like if you could do it again, like the joke of being like a meteorologist because like you're getting paid whether you're like right or wrong. Like man, like listen or you know just asking a uh, A L E X A can't say it obviously right. Like what's the weather? And it's like man, like it doesn't matter like if it is or is it. But it's just like the trends and we need to bring Briley back on at some point to talk about that and like arctic ice melting and i i just don't understand it like many things in life but weather really confuses me did you just now go into this tangent uh about the weather because we were talking about the weather or have you been pondering this thing well i've been pondering it not like deeply but like recently with this shift of whatever the last like what 96 hours i mean like I had to turn the chiller back on for my ice bucket, which is weird. I mean, I had 32 degree water without any effort 48 hours ago, and today I had 46 degree water. It's like well, that's a huge uh, swing. But then Nate Owen this morning, like getting dressed, like he went and grabbed a, this this big jacket. I'm like, nah, bro, you don't need that today. And he was like, why? I'm like, because it's warm. And he's like, why? And I'm like, exactly. I don't know why. Someone <laughs> has to know. But they don't tell us why. They just say global warming and emissions <laughs> and fossil fuels. But I, I don't know. Maybe I've missed that podcast on actually why, but I don't know why. And that's my weather Bro. rant for the day. Yeah. Are you, are you good? Are you going to be all right, Sha? <laughs> I just want to know why. <laughs> I don't know why. Sometimes you have to, uh, yeah, sometimes you have to let the why continue to be one of life's mysteries so that you can continue to move forward on stuff that maybe actually matters. But, you know, you'll be okay. It's going to be okay. But see, matter, matter impacts the <laughs> weather, see? Stop. <laughs> Dude, okay. We, all right. I think we could keep – I was going to ask you what you thought of, you know, the Kelsey thing up there and, you know, the big, the big burly man, big. you know, jumping down. <laughs> <laughs> They're like – the whole like conversation that apparently he had with like Kylie before that, of her being like, yeah, yeah we're we're, we're going to meet Taylor for the first time. Be on your best behavior. And then like seconds later, he's just a gorilla in, in like, you know, in his natural yeah. element, you know, just yeah. jumping around, drinking beer, like, picking up little girls to meet Taylor. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. you can tell like in some of the videos, the security guards are like, we're not allowed to let people do this, but it's it's Jason Kelsey. So like, yeah. one, he'll eat all of us, and two, just <laughs> let it go. And he just he comes out and just pops back in like a. I mean, he jumped no. in, back in that thing like like Mario just. Boop, boop, boop. Yeah, dude, he did not. And just for everybody who's completely lost, Taylor Swift has a boyfriend, and he plays football. And the f- football player's brother plays for the Eagles. But he was at the game, and he cheered on his brother when his brother got a touchdown. But I want to talk about. You said he just kind of popped back in there like a Mario brother, dude. He did a box jump. He's three hundred pounds, and he literally jumped back into the booth. It had to be three feet. Like, no, miss. He is a freaking beast of an athlete. He's not young anymore, either. No, yeah. He's, uh, like, what are they, 36, 30? Like, I mean, yeah. somewhat my age. 
but yeah, that was. I mean, yeah, ice. I mean, what, what was it? Zero. The temperature yeah. zero. Yeah. <laughs> Just bloop, bloop. Yeah. <laughs> I, anyway, I had a feeling. We've exchanged a couple of videos back and forth about all that, but yeah, it's it was it was neat. Uh, and you know, it could have went either way. It, the the media could have attacked it, like you know, who is this big you know ape of a looking man making a scene and picking up little girls to say Taylor? Like the, everybody spun it in a positive way, but I think because they got they've they've gotten used to it now. Like because originally when Taylor went to like her first game or first couple games, it was like. Taylor, 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 Taylor. And they're like, all right, we're over the, like, we're not over it, naturally, but it's like, let's focus on the game. They they could have went to this, like, well, now it's uh, Jason's turn to, like, the spotlight, let, let alone Travis, who had, what, three touchdowns in that game. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's, yeah. and now they're all, this morning they were talking about the night of the Super Bowl, she's in, oh, like, yeah. It, yeah. Where like Japan or she's in somewhere so, crazy and they're like if she's if it ends and she goes back in time but then goes forward in time again. It, it, no no no, she's gonna be performing in Paris and Paris yeah. is fourteen to sixteen hours ahead and so if she performs then hops on a jet she could fly back to Las Vegas, given the international dateline and the time change she could make it to the game and but she would she, she will she will have two Sunday nights. She would have already she had will. Sunday night. She will. I'll never forget when I returned from Japan in 1996 and my parents, not my, I think, my, yeah, it was my parents. Lori was there. Uh, they picked me up from the airport and I had tomorrow's newspaper. They were blown away because I was like, here's tomorrow's newspaper. And they, what? How? Uh, yeah. But, you know, international dateline. OK, look, let's. So you returned from Japan to Louisiana. Yes. Well, well, that's Houston, cool. but, Louisiana yeah. is cool. Louisiana is cool. I see what you did there. I tried, I tried and it like it was a little bit of a curve. It didn't work. As I know. Well as I... Usually I pick up on things a little faster than that. Um, but yeah, yeah, so without further ado, we got some guests for episode 44. Um, they're from Louisiana, but we'll let them tell you all that stuff. Myra Blaze, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having us. <laughs> we usually ask everybody to share with the audience, like, who are you? Where are you physically located, and why do you think you're on the Together We Shall podcast? So I'll let each of you individually answer that. Go mm -hmm. ahead. I'm Blaze. I'm originally from New Orleans, live in rain, married to Myra. And I'm Myra, and I'm, I'm raised in rain, and we're still in rain, back on the same land that I was pretty much when I was born. <laughs> And uh, I guess y'all asked us because uh, we've been part of the Ainsley's Angels group probably about six years now, I guess. Okay. And uh, we've had a blast and uh, we see y'all at a lot of the events. That's perfect. I love it. Well, that, you nailed it. And for all of our listeners, uh, New Orleans, of course, is in Louisiana. It's it's not a state. It's it's a, it's a city in Louisiana. You do have to go through Louisiana to get to Baton Rouge. But anyway, I digress. It's a funny thing that Joe and I will move along now. But rain is not four letters. It's five letters. It's got a Y. Um, and it, it is a city in Louisiana. Now, whereabouts in Louisiana is rain, Myra? Uh, we're about 20 miles west of Lafayette, Louisiana, and we're best known because we're the frog capital of the world. <laughs> Joe, frog capital yeah. of the world. I So I looked up where rain was a little while ago, and I did not expect to hear the, of the frog capital of <laughs> like the world. Not not Louisiana, not the United States, not North America, not the Western Hemisphere, the world. That's no, no. back in so, the day, it was a big so, uh, like, frog trading uh, city. I, this, uh, I, I guess because the railroad came through here or something is the stories I'm hearing. And we're also for a while we were the mural capital. I don't know if the world or America, but if you drive around our little city, they have frog statues and frog murals painted on. Most of the buildings in town. Now, how far is rain from uh, Interstate 10, uh, which runs east and west from San Diego to Jacksonville, Florida? Yeah. How far is rain from uh, 10? False. But, 
Barstow, it does not run from San Diego to Jacksonville, North Carolina. Barstow Where? to Wilmington. Oh. Barstow, California to Wilmington, North Carolina. Oh, that's the 40. Rewind everything. Damn it. Oh, my, ah! well, okay, so so getting back to where it is, I-10 comes through rain. It it bisects the town on the uh, the north end. So if you're on Interstate 10, you drive through rain. Yes. Do you have to go through rain to get to Baton Rouge? Oh, yes. If, okay. if you're coming from Lake Charles or points west. Okay. Yes. But you don't have to go through Baton Rouge to get to rain. <laughs> Only if you're coming from the other way. <laughs> anyway, so I did not know. Mural capital as well as the frog capital. And how many uh, stoplights-ish are in rain? Hold on. One, two, three, <laughs> four, five. I believe six. Probably. six I, Joe's I, like. I got the image map maps up and I'm like. There's not a lot. There's only 7,000 people. Yeah. yeah. That's about but right. How, about, many, about how many frogs? More than 7,000. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, they've wiped all the frogs out now. <laughs> oh, they gone. <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> that's not quite true. Oh, man, that's good. Well, um, well, yeah, y'all, y'all have been with Ainsley's Angels for a good five, six, seven years now. And some people might remember you, Myra, from the uh, the documentary that was filmed uh, in, in connection with our Ainsley's Angels race series and the on running. Um, they sent a production crew to you oh. to tell a story. Like, how how was that, Madame Movie Star? Um, that, that was awesome. <laughs> It was like being a movie star for a couple of days, and uh, they were great people to work with, and uh, they did a beautiful job, I thought, with the production, so we thoroughly enjoyed doing it. In, in fact, uh, one of our podcast guests was the director, Andrew Reed. We brought him onto the podcast to talk about the experience and his experience um, at growing up as an immigrant from Jamaica and eventually becoming an American citizen uh, and living with disability, frankly. Um, great story from Andrew, his journey. Uh, we loved his story so much. Uh, we were like, well, you want to come on the Angels Angels Board of Directors? So he's a he's a he's one of the board of directors for Angels. Oh, Angels. is he now? OK, he certainly is. So really neat. Um how things can just happen, connections and uh, breakpoints. So I, I'm I want to come back to like some of your Ainsley's Angels experiences, um, specifically like deep diving into some of the things you said in the video. But let's go back. Let's go chronologically backwards. Myra said you you uh, grew up there in Rain, and now you're here in Rain, living on the same land as the family had for years. Uh, Blaze mentioned being from New Orleans. Can can Blaze? Can you take us back to maybe young Blaze before Myra, and then maybe tell your version of how you met Myra, and then we'll do the same thing for for Myra there. Well, well come as you speaking of young Blaze, I want to be the first to uh, wish you both uh, a happy birthday. I know that's coming up soon. Uh, yeah. Um. Yeah. So I wanted to be the first. All right. Okay. Thank so, you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when is your birthday? Is is it the same day or something? What's going She's on? She's a week and a year older than me. Yeah. February seventh, okay. February fourteenth, for month. Oh, it's so a Valentine's, Valentine's baby. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we're gonna release this uh, here next Tuesday, which is like the last Tuesday of of uh, January, and then you all will have this podcast to share with the world as you celebrate your birthdays in February. So, all right, young Blaze, which is not the current Blaze, because Blaze isn't currently how, young. How how young? But when <laughs> when I met Myra. Just to the point of relevance, like you're in New Orleans, like what's relevant about your New Orleans formative years? And then and then take us to when you met Myra. Myra. So just kind of set it up a little bit. Well, my my, my dad worked on the racetrack. My dad was a, an ex jockey horse racing official and Lafayette had a thoroughbred uh, racetrack that had started in the early 70s here. Primarily at that time, Lafayette was a heavy Cajun French speaking area, but they didn't have a lot of horse people that were from bigger tracks. My dad moved up from New Orleans because he worked at the fairgrounds there, which was another big, old established racetrack. 
And I would come up in the summertime with my dad and stay with him in the summer. My mom still lived in New Orleans. Well, when time got on later in life, my mom moved up to Lafayette to be with my dad. And I happened to have a job and go to school as uh, 1977, I would say. And I got a job at an auto parts store uh, to supplement money. And Myra worked at one of the other branches of it. And I started to see her. And immediately I was attracted to her. And her sister, I think, and my boss at the time, uh, Easton Trohan, said, well, y'all go out and have a good time. And it didn't work out at first, uh, mainly because she had never been with somebody that was, let's say, a, a hippie. <laughs> you know, she she, somebody unconstricted. Wow, and dude, I didn't this have is great. Rules and I was breaking all the rules. <laughs> and she came from a very tight knit Catholic doctrine family, and it was very hard for them to accept me. I had long hair. I smoked. I, I did everything bad that a person could do <laughs> that wasn't in their thing for what their little. <laughs> daughter that the her the dad's favorite daughter let me put it like that okay uh, i just didn't fit in at first Dude. but we stayed we stayed dating and it it started to work for us i guess <clears throat> all right well you you stop now blaze because there's i want to get my side of this whole story uh <laughs> before we go any further but joe bro god you want to talk about an opportunity to tangent. I did not know that Blaze was a hippie. I did. I, <laughs> well, I didn't know a lot of things. I mean, the racetracks and, and all that. But I'm also now wondering, like, all right, so he, he obviously got the girl. Did he get the girl by shaving his, his hair? Because clearly uh, that's gone. <laughs> well, we'll come back to that, I bet you, right now. So, Myra, so Myra, go ahead. So as much as I want to hear about all growing up in rain, let's yeah. skip that for a second. Tell us about when you first saw Blaze and your version of that story. Yeah. So I was, I was in my last semester at college, and uh, they had an opening at the auto parts store that my sister worked at. So I took a part-time job there. And uh, like Blaze said, we were at kind of across town from each other. But he would run the parts from his store to our store and vice versa. So he would come in and he'd wave and, you know, whatever. And the the boss lady there said, I think he likes you. I think he wants to ask you out. And I said, oh, never. <laughs> that was my first reaction. <laughs> and uh, about a week later, they tell me that I have to start going to his store once a week to do the inventory for them. And I think that was a setup by the bosses, maybe. So uh, I started going over there and, you know, found out he was a pretty nice guy. He uh, was funny, you know, and um, he he kept asking me out. And so uh, being in an overabundance of caution in the bubble I was raised in, you know, I said, OK, we'll go on a double date. So we got my cousin and her uh, fiance to come on a double date with us and uh we had a really nice time, and then he didn't ask me out for like two months after that. And I'm like, geez, you know, he tried so hard to get me to go on a date. We go on a date, and then nothing, you know. Blaze, so, uh, Blaze, what say you, bro? What's up with that? <laughs> then nothing. Po poverty. <laughs> poverty. Our <laughs> friends cost money. <laughs> to yeah. all our young listeners, do you hear yeah. that, friends? She, she came from an established family, and I had. I had a, a Cars cassette deck hooked up to a battery in my front room was my sound system. And what so was playing? I had no money. And what was playing on that sound system? What was your go-to cassette in, in mid-1970s there? Bad Company. Uh, bad Company. I'm not even going to try to sing it. But Blaze, bro, mind is blown. I love this. I... I might even have like flipped the roles. Like Myra was a hippie <laughs> and Blaze was a conservative <laughs> Christian upbringing, Catholic altar boy. Yeah, no, I, wow. Okay, so back to Joe's question. Was it the hair, Myra? Did the hair attract you? 
No, or was it he like... did not. <laughs> he didn't <laughs> cut it. He did not cut it, I don't think. Well, he cut it a little bit, but for our wedding was when he really cut it. Like, I was shocked because he cut it all off for the wedding, you know? So, when did you get married? We got married in 1980. Two years after we met, I would say. Yeah. Right at about, about two years. Yep. Okay. Now, and you got to remember said... some the other things that were going on at the time, at that point. You had the gas shortages going on. So, going from Lafayette and being making very little money, what I did, all the way out to Rain to take her out. Financially, there was that. Uh, Every guy had a perm at that time. I did not look. I was trying to wear my perm out. It looked terrible. Uh, but they had those things going on. You can't. I can't drive fifty-five. I mean, all of those things in America was going on at that time. And I drove a Volkswagen. Yeah. I drove a Volkswagen, and they Wait. her parents didn't feel it was a very safe car. For their handicapped daughter <laughs> that had never been released into the wild. <laughs> you know, like they put her into this immense Chevrolet Caprice. <laughs> worried that with her brittle bone disease that, you know, it would absorb the impact should she get into a wreck. And here I am in a Volkswagen <laughs> that they didn't like import cars. It's yeah. small. If you get in a wreck because you're you're not the good type, <laughs> our daughter's gonna get killed. Wow, I mean, this one is of those things that went on <laughs> in our relationship that I had to struggle through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, dude, like this this is freaking fascinating. Uh, I'm gonna keep we're gonna keep going here. All right, so but Myra, Blaze mentioned the handicapped daughter, the brittle bone piece. Like, can you give us some background on that? And and yeah. then we're going to use that to get us all back up to 1980. And then we're going to proceed into the past 1980. So t okay. give us some background there. So uh, I was born, I uh, have a twin brother and uh, I'm one of six kids. And I was born, it was just a spontaneous genetic mutation. And I was born with a condition called osteogenesis imperfecta. They call it OI or brittle bone disease, and it's very rare. Um, and actually, I have uh, two other siblings who were diagnosed with it, and two of our children were diagnosed with it. And uh, but by far, mine was much more severe than any of the others. And but we had no family history up until that time of the uh, disease. So uh, I was kind of started breaking bones when I was one years old and up until about 12 years old, I probably had 30 plus fractures uh, during that time frame. And then I don't know, by the grace of God, when I turned 12 and puberty kicked in, sometimes uh, you, your bones will grow a lining, I was told, and strengthen. And I knock on wood, I have not had a fracture since then. Uh, but uh, it it could, you know, as you age with osteoporosis and whatnot, you know, the likelihood of it occurring again will be very high. Well, thanks for sharing all that. Joe's got a question and then I got 27 questions. Go okay. Ahead, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I didn't know about two of your children having it. Um, how old are they now? With them, their cases were really mild. So uh, our oldest son probably had the more severe, and he probably had, I don't know, 15 to 20 fractures, you know, if you count fingers and things like that. And our daughter only had about three uh, fractures. And then as she got older, and she actually just had a child, she did actual genetic testing. And even though we were told she had it, uh, they're not so sure that she actually had it. So, and I've never been genetically tested. So, um, hard and to you tell. all have how many kids? Four. Four. Yeah. How was how was that? Um, I guess uh, what we call it, child bearing, like for the obvious, it did nothing broke, right? But like, no, did it? No, was that no. a concern? Yeah, it was a very big concern. In fact, when I got pregnant for Josh, uh, my doctor, who was a high risk doctor, dropped me because he didn't want to deal with it. 
I don't and, know why I, pi- I pictured physically like drop to you like I don't yeah, know why yeah. but, like, yeah. get up on yeah. the table and boom yeah, yeah. but uh, I luckily hooked up <laughs> with a very um good local doctor who took great concern in my case and studied it and successfully delivered my four kids by c-section that was the only um kind of prevention we took uh and that was by my choice both for me and for them so uh and they all grew up healthy and we have three nurses and an insurance uh agent in the group and uh they're uh they're I think a good bunch of kids. So. Yeah, for sure. And now we have wow, grandkids, that's... and we have one on another one on the way. So we're real happy with that. And uh, our our grandson, our youngest grandson, was born last year, and he has Down syndrome. And uh, so he, we're hopeful that he'll be a future Ainsley's Angels rider in the next few years. Heck yeah, maybe even eventually pushing you at some point. <laughs> you, know, it, well, you know what I mean? Well, I mean, there, there's this. Well, we've seen this before, where riders uh, and uh, those that have Down syndrome going through the process of uh, of becoming riders and gaining that appreciation, that acceptance, that belonging at yeah. race day, getting to a point at eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, where they're like, "I'm good with being pushed. I'm physically able to run. I want to run." I mean, I call it a premonition, but Myra, you better get ready. We don't need to talk about ages unless we want to, but you have a, you know, a milestone um, coming up, not in, what is it, four years, but the one after that, that, that so 14 years, uh, that individual would be 14. So there could be some milestones there uh, for a 5K for sure. Oh, yeah, for sure. I have no, I have no I idea. I had to do the math said. on age. I had to do the math on age and I didn't want I you know, I didn't want to put it I, out there. But. I could tell you were doing math in public though in your head, but you didn't want to say numbers. Anyway. Well um, speaking of numbers, I, I probably say we've got to be the oldest combined <laughs> age team that Ainsley's probably has I, ever had. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the only ones At- giving them a run might be team two for one, but I don't know those ladies' ages, nor will I ever ask. They were previous podcast guests. Podcast guests. Um, they oh, they no. have children that are akin to your – Joe, don't go looking up team I two I got to know, ages. man. I, I'm not going to say <laughs> – like this, say in, in less than a month, we'll top out 131 years <laughs> of age. You said it. Because yep. earlier I was like, man, I think – these are our oldest podcast guests. And I was like, oh, yeah, definitely. But I, yeah, let's, uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to well, no. say it, but I got to know. <laughs> Can we just now, cut to the chase here, how please? Are, how old are you going to be? Oh, yeah, in you, February? you got it. You got them by 10 years, man. I will, I will be 65. I am okay. already receiving all of the Medicare <laughs> yes. mail, mail every yeah. day. I've got somebody wants to, yeah. my business. <laughs> yeah. Got it. Of course, by the so uh, okay. It's uh, we we're not. I don't hide our age. It is what it is. You know. Yeah, I yeah, I think Joe's making a a push towards eighty. So I think that's where. Yeah. So when y'all are eighty, your grandson can push you. Yeah. Okay. Cop shit. By that point, Blaze. I mean, I don't. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe you got two grandsons. One pushing Meyer. One pushing Blaze. I don't, I don't, I don't see any of that. I don't look past the two years. I, I, that's my, that's my outlook on life. I just want another two good years every two years. You know? I love that, brother. I yeah. love that. that. Yeah, that's quotable. You know, if you dream too far in, in in ahead, you lose what's right in front of you. I find that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Quotable. Quotable. Yeah. Well done. Yeah, I, I love it. I shared something on Facebook earlier. Um, very similar that was like everyone starts off you know january with these big goals and i'm going to be a astrophysicist or something it's like just focus on this year and break it down by the year and then you have the the four seasons and in those four seasons are the three months and those months a week and just take it step by step by step and if you yes it's a every day yes what the movie What About Bob, right? Uh, Bill Murray, Baby Steps. Yeah. Those baby steps are eventually <laughs> going to lead to big steps, and, and you'll get there. Yeah. Mm. 
I like solid it. stuff. Um, I, before we get too far into the future, can we go back one more time? I, I do want to give uh, some airtime to Myra, you helping us kind of elaborate a little bit more on what Blaze alluded to. You know, he said, you know, Myra, the daughter, the disabled daughter, she's in she's in this uh, cocoon. You even said a bubble, I think, Myra. <laughs> um, like, w- w- did your bone, did your bone disease uh, create a physical disability? Uh, I know the answer, but some people yes, don't know. Yes, it did. You. Yes, it did. Because uh, most of my fractures were in my legs and especially on my left leg. So it stunted the growth in my left leg. And I have like a three inch buildup on that foot. So I walk with crutches uh, for, you know, when it's not as I age, it's uh, it's impacted me more. So I use the crutches not just for balance, but support. And then if I have longer distances, I'll, I'll, I have a scooter I'll get around in. Now, so, how, has, how was life in the 60s in South Central Louisiana with a disability? Like, how, how were you treated? How were you not treated? Like, can you give us some context there? And maybe compare that to how it is today in the same area. Yeah, uh, I guess I was very blessed being born in a small town in a huge family because I probably had like 50 something first cousins, you know, and our neighborhood was full of kids. So our house was kind of like the meeting grounds. <laughs> so there was always people, you know, I never felt alone uh, or really too different because uh, even though I spent a lot of time in the hospital, you know, back in the day, they would keep you in traction for weeks. So you'd be in the hospital rather than the way they treat fractures today so uh you know um I attended the regular school which was only like three blocks from where we live and they back in the day they would send kids from school to run to my house to bring the test over to me and uh I guess it was about in third grade they developed an intercom system so I could be you know at home in a hospital bed and listen to everything that was going in at class, you know, and because my brother was in my class too, uh, they convinced all these kids that I was this little bitty person living in that box (laughs) and they would all come and bang on the, like the, to get my attention, you would hit the top of the box and it would ring on my side and they'd say, are you really in there? And I'm like, yeah, you know, (laughs) and they would all, I just play along. You know, but uh, I I think I had a, you know, other than the fractures, I had a really pretty good childhood. Well, you mentioned being blessed into a big family in a small town. Like what I just heard you talk about is you were surrounded by allies. You were surrounded by people. Yeah. Who lifted you up, who helped you have accessibility, have education, have sense of belonging. Um, And I think we preach that all the time on this podcast and Angels Angels. Like those are the elements to be an ally and to do those things. So that's really, really awesome that you had that given um given the what you were born with so that's yeah. that's special you said in your video that was produced and i'm going to actually put the video at the end of this podcast because while the video itself is awesome it's the words because i've listened to it and not watched it i've gone through that exercise and there's some powerful sharing in there but in the video you say i quote growing up with a disability i was always a spectator It is one thing to spectate, but it takes you to a whole nother level when you're able to participate. I just got body chills reading that. Tell me what you think of when I read that to you just now. Yeah. I mean, I I just think about like the first race that we did with Ainsley's Angels and the many we've done since then, you know, um, and then now that we had kids and we supported them in their sporting activities and whatnot, you know, I never had that thrill or joy of people cheering me on, you know, like you get at the finish line at Ainsley's Angels, you know, uh, it, it was like so foreign to me, <laughs> at, you know, when I got to experience that, it was like, wow, I never knew I was missing out on something, but, you know, experiencing that, it really made me feel like you know, more of a part of like a group activity, which I never had gotten to do before either, you know? So uh, it's brought a whole new awareness to me. You know, the camaraderie 
between runners. I never knew about that, you know, and we did uh, one of the half marathons, I guess, you know, with Ainsley's Angels. And, you know, when you're running and how people are like, okay, y'all doing a great job. Keep going, you know, don't give up. And all the encouragement you get along the way. I never even imagined that. I thought everybody was like, out against each other, you know, like uh, like you watch team sports and you see yo know, you didn't you know you hate the other team and you pulling for your team, you know. But out there, it was just a whole different uh, environment. I mean, you know, maybe the really elite athletes have a different view, but we're never up at the start. <laughs> Too long I, again. <laughs> I've had a chance to meet quite a few elite athletes, and I will tell you that these folks are just as supportive of each other. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful, wonderful community, and it's a great place for us yeah. to exercise what we do. Now, Blaze, you push Myra. In fact, you've pushed Myra in almost all of her races. Um, I know that um, I can say that I had the honor of pushing Myra or being pulled by Myra in a 4th of July race, and you, <laughs> you were like, bro, like, you're going to push my wife today. And, uh, you know, you, it's almost like I was about to take your daughter out on a date. I was, I was like, are, are you sure this is okay, Blaze? Like, can I, anyway, you push her. Talk to me about how it feels when the both of you get out there on the course together. Cause you were a runner before, uh, Myra joined the course. No, what's the story there? You know, I, I'll tell you how it went. I, uh, I became a runner maybe two months before we started getting involved with Ainley's Angels. I was out of shape. I was a heavy smoker. I was not doing any activity other than work. I decided I was going to get healthy this year. It was sometime in September. I quit smoking, boom, and everything. And I started running just 100 yards at a time. I had no ox. I couldn't run. We happened to see at our fish camp in Hackberry, Louisiana, a flyer that said, park to park in Sulphur 10K. Well, we would go every weekend to the camp in Hackberry, and Sulphur was not that far away. And it was a small community also, so I didn't feel threatened about being terrible. So I went and got in the race, and when we showed up in the morning, the first thing we saw was the Ainsley's Angels trailer and people getting loaded up into the chariots to start this race. Now, we, did, we didn't talk to anybody during, but I asked Myra, I said, would you want to do that if they let you? <laughs> and she said, yeah, I wouldn't mind giving it a try. So after the race, and it was just a 10K, took me, you know, a long time to finish it, but they were still <laughs> there. And I remember going up to Christine and Tracy and asking them, this is my wife. Would she be allowed to do that? And how much does it cost? Because, <laughs> you know, I ain't got that much money. <laughs> and they said, no, she is fine. Yes, come do this. This is our next race. Let's meet your wife. And no, it doesn't cost anything. Just bring her, please. And that is our way we became associated with Ainsley's Angels was through the Sulphur Park to Park, just seeing the trailer there. And we were both like, wow, <laughs> look at, because, you know, we see her physical condition, which has, I'll tell you how bad she was. When, before I ever met her, she got out of a cast one day, her sister sat on the bed, but not on her. And it, the, the movement of the bed caused her to break again. And go into a lower full body cast. Wow. She got out of a cast. Someone sat on the bed. It moved it too soon. Back in a full body cast. So that's what her bone disease was like. So when I say that she was fine later on when we put her in the chariot, my biggest fear was, okay, the bumps, the bounces. She's never been on an amusement ride, really, because they're too violent for her. So yeah. I'm worried, okay, so when I'm running... Pushing her, I'm looking for every bump to let her know to, to tighten up. You know, there's just so many things that would, for her disability, for others, it, it you know, their bodies can absorb that bump. Now, for her, that was my biggest concern was, is this going to hurt her bouncing? Because she's never had to endure the bounce of it. And I'll say the chariots are so well made and padded 
that that has never even been an issue of ours. You know, my concern for her safety, just or her happiness, just get after it. Wow, well, thanks for sharing all that, man. I, I did not know the depth. I, I never knew that story. That is, I love it. Joe, what, what do you got? Well, it was, it was great because, yeah, talking about the, the quitting smoking and all that. And I was like, I wonder, because I didn't know, you know, how you guys got connected. And I think it was like in 2018, right, with, with the organization. So it was great. You saved you saved the question. Um, and obviously it it's worked out and you guys have done half marathons together. I mean, how many races now do you think you guys have, have done? I don't know. We do we do ten every year at with Angley's. At least. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well the last episode we had Tracy on and she mentioned that y'all were gonna go do Houston with Heather. How was right. the Houston? Did y'all go the half marathon there? What y'all do? Half marathon. Tell well, us about that. I, I, I'll tell you, uh, she can't take, I'm too slow. So she can't take a full marathon with me pushing. So she, her next thing with being, she wants to try is a full marathon. We're going to go let her do Marine Corps with y'all. Whoa. Uh, I, I missed this. Wait, wait. Whoa. Is this true? Yeah. Did I know this? No, we're, we're, we're just, we had to make sure we had somebody stable to push her. Wait, 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 wait. So, did you just, de- did y'all just declare just now on live air? Joe, did you know this? Much, yeah. Yeah. Joe, what? Dude, I, this is great. This so, is an so Houston, Myra, is she coming this year? 2024, October? 2024. Yeah. How, Joe, did you know that? <laughs> I did not. Email so, Joe at AinsleysAngels.org. Everybody who wants to see Myra at Marine uh, Corps Marathon in October. Joe? I, this is like, exciting. I, it it happened so quick. Like I pulled up my roster and I'm writing it down. Like I don't want to yeah. forget. Like yeah, this is great because yeah. then I'll see it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh man, for Houston that. half marathon. We had never encountered that many people. We're not good with crowds. I'm so worried she's going to get hit, knocked down. Uh, the things that I have to worry about as a caregiver. A little different from other ones, you know. I'm her shield <laughs> in traffic, you know. I'm always pushing people like, hey, you can't back up on her, you know. And But Houston, as far as Ainsley's Angels, people over there, Heather and her group, unbelievable how well done 30,000 people in a race can just have 20 riders with chariots and we're in people way when we're that slow. You know, don't get me wrong. They're having a run around us. These people, for having 30,000 people in a race, this was unbelievable how well managed these runners were to let us in there and run around with no conflicts whatsoever. All the support and, uh, you know, accolades, like you're doing a great job as they passed you up, you <laughs> know. Uh, just wonderful yeah. experience over there. It really was. Yeah, That's it was massive. Uh, I've never run, you know, that was the biggest one we've ever done. And what really got me was how well organized it was. I mean, Heather and them really put together a great event for us. I mean, for the whole weekend, not just the day of the race, you know. And uh, the whole race, you didn't go maybe 100 yards without people on the side of the road. I mean, people in Houston really come out and cheer and support this event and that was amazing to me i i I feel really fortunate at this time frame uh, of being involved with ainsley's angels the ambassadorships that louisiana has i don't know about the the other areas in the country it, I can only say if they're run anything similar to Louisiana's ambassadors. I, I I know Landis on a personal basis. He runs a great one. I know the the people that's up in Shreveport and Monroe. If everybody has that kind of concern over all of the people that are riders and runners, Ainsley's just going to keep growing. It, it, it's going to one good turn deserves another. All those things that you hear, the the inclusion that people are allowed. In this, it it blows my mind that people can be that nice and not get anything out of it. You know, yeah. anybody can be nice and helpful and, and do that when they're getting a, a stipend, money, and paid. These people are giving up their own money, their own time. Tad, I reference Tad all the time. My God, you know, he's got so many other things he could be doing. 
You know, it's not like he has a child with a disability or something. He's doing it because of the love of it. That's the real heroes in this thing. Not not me pushing her. Those people that get the chariot ready for her. We had one instance where there was a need to reset the tire because it wasn't quite right. And they took the time when they had all these other things to do to set this tire correct for Myra. That's a worry I don't have to have is that something's going to happen mechanically and injure my wife. They do this for us. And that that's the beauty of this thing. Yeah, it is really pre- pretty and special and fabulous. And I have so many places I want to take all of those comments. But the one I think that's worth highlighting is you started in Southwest Louisiana. You got to do events down the road in Baton Rouge and Acadiana and New Orleans and up north in Louisiana. And then you had a chance to go to Houston and nothing changed. Like no. it was no. And that's the beauty of what we have tried to scale yes. is that if you start with the mission, if you're pure with your intentions, then then it will translate. And as soon as it doesn't, you got two Marines named Rooster and Joe <laughs> who will pick up on that pretty fast and, ex- and and lean into the team of leaders to find out, you know, did we make a mistake? Is this just not the right fit for this local leader to have this responsibility? Because if you're not helping others, if you're not giving without expectation, if you're not doing this with respect, if you're not bringing optimism and enthusiasm to race day morning and all the while being accepting and loving and caring and and bringing this environment to the fold, then it won't grow, Blaze, to your point. It won't grow. It will fall. It will it will implode. And so it is really awesome for Joe and I to hear the way that you just articulated that and singing the praises of our guardian angels like Tad and our ambassadors across Louisiana and into Texas. And, and you will see. Yeah, we got to shout out Beth, Beth and yeah. Jen. And Kim. Yeah. Oh, yep. That's a Kim. good group there too. We've done a lot of oh, races yeah. with them as well. And I love that you did that because that's where I was going to go. I was going to say it, it's you have gotten to see Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas. But I can tell you, as you travel to our other 70 locations and hundreds of communities across the country, that same line that connects us all, humanity, love, inclusion, giving without expectation, it runs strong. And when you come to Washington, D.C. in October, you're going to meet a whole new crew of people and you're going to get to see it there too. So, I'm I'm overjoyed. I'm I'm so excited for you all. Joe? It yeah, I mean god, like you said, the, the way the things we could talk about now, I mean, going to Houston, 30,000 runners, um, you know, at that event, 10 years of um, you know, athletes, you know, with special needs participating there is great. Now you're going to come to Marine Corps and what's really exciting to me is you're going to come at the, on the 49th year. And you're going to see 40 plus thousand people and over probably 150, you know, uh, athletes, right, to that starting line. And you're not going to go 100 feet without seeing people. And then you're going to cross that finish line, Myra. And Blaze is going to be so excited that it happened. You're going to go, I can't wait to come next year for the 50th. (laughs) And I challenge you not to tell me that. When you get up to the tent and you're having a sandwich and we're all sitting down, uh, you know, Sunday afternoon, I challenge you not to say all right we'll we'll be back next year and then again you're (laughs) going to get to meet all some of these ambassadors that you you haven't met and you're going to see that same love and i'm really glad that we record these and that this is a podcast because that 90 seconds to two minutes that you talk there blaze is is great we're going to be able to share that with the ambassadors you know not just in louisiana texas mississippi but but all over i mean there's there's some neat things that our marketing team's going to be able to do with that so thank you for you know, the pat on the back to, to all those folks out there, you know, across yep. the country doing, doing that work. It, it means a lot to them and it means a lot to us to hear uh, you all say that. So the question that I really have, though, is, is who's pushing Myra? We have uh, Amber Geyser. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> How about that, Amber? I went, for, I went for the the the, the strongest <laughs> female runner that I know personally. I said, Myra, I'm going to try and talk to Amber. So I got yeah. Amber on my side, and she said yes. Joe, is Amber on your list? She is on on the list. Um, you know, I. Uh, this is great. I, I don't, yeah, I don't, that's, yeah, that's a, a great fit. Um, 
Amber's done the race a handful of times. He's a great human being. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to to see you all in whatever it is, a handful of months, a lot of months really. But I mean, that's great for like the listeners out there. Like, I mean, this is the the pitch, right? There's still time. There's spots mm-hmm. for you if you're listening or watching this. We we have them. Runners, riders. If you want to come to DC, email Joe at ainsleysangels.org. I will say, Rooster, and you'll like this, that we are, we're, we're about 45% full on bibs already. And it's not even the end of January. Yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So you very got, excited. Yes. <laughs> yeah, get, yeah, get, get with Joe. Registered. Get with Joe. He'll give you all the guidance. So that's exciting, man. Got gosh, who knew this little nugget was going to present itself? <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I don't even really know where I even want to go. Uh, so let me, let me think here. Where can we take this conversation now? Blaze, wh- what do you want to tell us about? Uh, no, you know what, Myra, how about this? Myra, tell me about the, the first time that you crossed the finish line and felt like you were participating and not the spectator you alluded to when you got back in the car and you and blaze are driving back to rain what what was the conversation uh it was how amazing the experience was and how the people were so giving and accepting you know uh it was you know and being a disabled person you know it you could really easily feel sorry for yourself but when you're in that kind of environment and you get to meet all these other people, I, you know, I tell them, I'm like, I almost don't feel disabled, you know, because it's, you know, it, it was just unbelievable the disabilities that some of these people had and they were out there and the joy on everybody's face, you know, the runners, the riders and all the people associated with the angels angels organization you just felt the love of everybody you know you immediately felt accepted and i mean i cried when we crossed the finish line that first time because it was just so much joy you know to be able to experience that and do that what race was that the first one mm-hmm. um if we first saw them at sulfur park to park right. which is in march or february into that then the next thing Ainsley's did would have been Band. one of the one of the three races in Lake Charles, uh, either the three miler at Athletes Corner, the four miler for Fourth of July. I can tell you this: you signed up April eighteenth, twenty eighteen. So we could probably go wow. back to the race oh, schedule. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who signed the document? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tw- Another one I I signed away. Twice. I didn't even know. Twice. <laughs> Did you get it for Acadiana and Lake Charles? Yeah. Twice. There you yeah. go. Because, yeah, we did. When uh, the Acadiana group formed, we did sign up with them. And, uh, you know, we've been lucky to be able to run with so many of the different groups. It's It's been a great experience with each and every one of them. That's what we always say, you know, together we shall and that it's one big family. So it, it can feel like different groups. But as you're getting a chance to go to Baton Rouge, Mississippi and Houston, yeah. Lake Charles, like at the end, do you get that vibe, that feeling that it's all one big family? Yes. Oh, Absolutely. yes. So much. So much. Yeah. The only thing that we uh, hope changes is really just the scenery, you know, the weather. <laughs> right. But yeah, the 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 ambiance. Yeah, some it. good weather for this Saturday, please. <laughs> What y'all got right. coming up this Saturday? What's going We're on? We're doing the Mardi Gras Mambo in mm. Baton Rouge. And there's like, I think, a 75% chance of rain that morning. <laughs> and, and that's how you say it, Joe, Baton Rouge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was well being, done. Being, the Cajun um, pronunciation. So, <laughs> what is this Mardi Gras thing? I mean, I know what it is. Joe yeah. thinks he knows what it is. Like, what? <laughs> what, <laughs> what is Mardi Gras? Tell the people that don't live in Louisiana how you would describe Mardi Gras and what it represents to you. Mardi Gras is like a one continuous party from the Epiphany, I guess, and usually in January until uh, Fat Tuesday, which is for uh, Lent in the Christian. Yeah. World again. And so there's parties, there's parades and um, balls and 
you name it, they are celebrating. And uh, king cakes are real big now. And I don't know that that's a secret just down here now, because I think they ship them everywhere. And we we were lucky to have our first king cake of the season last night. And it was delicious. <laughs> yeah. So these are these are baked goods with a whole lot of sugar and icing and glaze on top. But but what's inside of well, the king cake? Well, this one, they, they hide a baby. And whoever gets the piece with this little plastic baby has to buy the next king cake. <laughs> but the place my son got it at last night, they're actually putting a diamond in one of the king cakes this year. And whoever gets that fake diamond will get a real diamond. <laughs> so that's a new thing. <laughs> now, do you you said you grew up in a Catholic uh, family. Do you know the history behind why there's a baby in these king cakes and what the semblance of that is? Yeah, I mean, the baby uh, represents the Christ baby, you know, and uh, even all the colors, you know, the greens and purples and everything, everything is symbolic. If if you read, I, I, could, I don't want to misquote it, so, but there's history and it's a Catholic history behind everything related to Mardi Gras and uh, pretty much they were preparing for the beginning of Lent on Ash Wednesday and... So they would throw these big celebrations. <laughs> yes. And I think over the years, it's just grown and grown and grown. So, you know, our little town had its first official Mardi Gras parade uh, last Saturday, in fact. So it, it yeah. continues to spread that it used to be only the big towns where Blaze was from. New Orleans, of course, is well known for Mardi Gras. And uh, they probably have a parade almost every day during Lynn, I think. And uh, now the outlying little towns are getting involved, and they, they each have their own parades now. It's been really cool for Angels Angels to be involved in Mardi Gras season as well. I mean, for example, in southwest Louisiana, they're in the, the children's parades. In fact, they're the right. Grand Marshal. Yeah, they're the Grand Marshal for the parade this year in Lake Charles. Oh. And over in New Orleans, Blaze, uh, the, the New Orleans ambassadorship was invited to participate in the parade that's happening on 11 February. And I'm told it's the biggest of all the Mardi Gras parades. It starts in front of the Children's Hospital and it, it rolls far and away. But um, that is pretty special because there was a time during the celebration of Mardi Gras, dare I say, during the parades, that those with disabilities may not have been able to go to the parade. There was a time where people were put away and God forbid the public sees them. Yeah. And now today the grand marshal and invited to the biggest new Orleans parade are going to be our angels rolling. Like that mm -hmm. is what I'm talking about. It's beautiful. Yeah. And so to be included in this. Yeah. Yeah. Belonging celebration inclusion. It's just so beautiful. But uh, I, you know, Thank you for that tie to, to what Mardi Gras represents at its core and what it has become today. Um, but I just can't I can't get out of my head the fact that Blaze was a hippie. So, so <laughs> I'll have tell to me find some, you a picture. <laughs> so we need a picture yes. for our Instagram. So the Together We Shall podcast has an Instagram channel. And when we launch our episodes oh, on Tuesdays. I'll, I'll, send, I'll yeah. send you my 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 high school. I still have it. My high school uh id from new orleans <laughs> yeah before i moved up to lafayette and yeah, it just the hair before. just got longer <laughs> yeah so we're, we're gonna look for like five to six seven pictures if y'all could go through and give us some you know <laughs> young young myra in the box you know people are are you in there are you in there yeah <laughs> <laughs> to uh to blaze in high school and then maybe when y'all dated maybe when y'all got married because then blaze got a haircut and then yeah. whatever else you want to share, three or four pictures, that'd be awesome. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, man, this has been fun, dude. This is this has exceeded any expectation or idea about how this conversation was gonna go. This has just been just been a blast. And and Joe, I'm not gonna edit anything. There's nothing in this episode that I need to go back and edit. There's no ums and flows and pauses. This has been fun. Uh Joe, is there anything that you want to say as we start to get on to the, the back half or the conclusion of today's show? Uh, man, I just, I don't know. I don't want to wait for these pictures. So I'm like looking through Facebook. I'm like, there's got to be a, uh, there's got to be a one on there. But yeah, I guess I'll wait for the picture. Um, but I think what I want to, one of the things I want to say is going back to what Myra said, right? And I mean, obviously the powerful words from the on video, but like she said, the, 
the feeling of inclusion. I mean, we've heard it going back, uh, you know, at least for me, you know, when when Rick said, you know, when I'm running, it feels like my disability disappears. And and we've heard that over, you know, the whatever 15 years that I've been around, give or take, you know, within the organization to where that's it. Like, and it doesn't have to be running. It's the parade. It's the dinner where, you know, the riders, if you would, right, or just the individuals are like, I don't have a disability here. We're all one. We're all the same. We're having fun. Um, and that's just great to hear um, the reminder that, you know, and like Blaze said, that like there's people out there doing great things and it makes everybody happy. And and in the end, that's that's it. The smile is uh, what it's all about. So thank so, you for so reminding often, us, both so of you. Often when, when we're meeting the, the other riders from other areas, you know, for myself, I don't hear real well. And I, I struggle to understand what some people are saying just in a natural voice. But the effort that to get down on someone's level in their eye level in their chair and have a little conversation with some of these people, you know, I am humbled at that point. You know, I, I don't get too choked up. But when I am trying to communicate with somebody that struggles to communicate even and they're telling me that I'm doing a great job. I'm doing a great job. No, man, you're <laughs> doing a great job. You know, they're telling me great job. And it's not about me. And it's about them. And then when you hug somebody, you, you, you don't even worry about, you know, you just, it, it's the love that's right there at that moment. And that's what the pictures never get to, to copy. Is they don't see that one instant where somebody's eyes connected and they say, you know, here's two people from very different worlds. And I can say, look at them and saying, you know, man, I love you. And it's true. Yeah. And wow. This Ainsley's has been one of the few things that I can ever associate in my life that there's a, a, a care and a love that just goes beyond how much you make, what you are, who you are. You know, it, it doesn't matter skin color, nationality old age, young person, you know, it's just that there's a connection of somebody cares about somebody. That's all it is. Che cheers to that, Blaze. Cheers to yeah. that. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to yeah. bring Blaze around on some speaking engagements. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's pretty yeah. good. He doesn't he's got it. credit, but he's he got is it. pretty good. That's one of the things that attracted him to me was that uh, after we did go out on a date, that one time he did write me this card, this beautiful poem, and stuck it in my card. And that's really what got my attention. So he's pretty good with words, you know. Yeah. And, and all, all, the person some, doesn't some other like it, he can't hear anyway. Some other tidbits, y'all, I know y'all don't know about Myra. So many people in her family never thought of her getting out of a wheelchair. See, she was in a wheelchair when I met her. They had never seen this girl walk. When she was getting married, she decided, I'm going to walk down the aisle. And this is a long Catholic church aisle because <laughs> she had a big Catholic church wedding. And she held on to her dad with the built up shoe. And that was the longest she had ever walked distance wise in her life was to come get married to me. Yeah. yeah. People were like crying. <clears throat> never seen Myra out of a wheelchair, out of a cast are now watching her walk down and yeah, down get married. Yeah, that's the beautiful. Church, was, church was, was, was crying, that's for sure. I thought we were going to get through an episode without me uh, having some watery eyes and tears falling, dude, but you just <laughs> did it with that. That is freaking powerful, dude. And, and like, to think how you were feeling seeing her overcome and and persevere to get to the symbolism, the transition, the, just the, no, God, dude, like, that is powerful. That is beautiful. Wow. Yeah, Dude, we have, we need a picture of her coming down that aisle too, man. That's <laughs> wow. wow. And the picture man. of her dad, when he shook my hand and he said, if you break my daughter's heart, I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. It, yeah. It was funny. You, Cause I thought you were going to say, if you break one of my daughter's bones, you know, <laughs> I, no, I he thought was, he, <laughs> he had finally accepted me at that time that he couldn't get yeah. rid of me. That's wow. That's awesome. This has been a really fun episode. I, thanks for accepting the invitation. And no, I look for, I look forward to seeing y'all this July, Sunset 5K, and then in October at Marine Corps. 
it's just gonna be great. Yeah, I mean, we're looking forward to another year of it. Yeah, Myra, we're gonna give the microphone to you. <laughs> you want to take us home? What do you want to leave the listeners with? I'm just gonna encourage everybody to reach out to somebody you know who's disabled and tell them about this organization because they're missing out on something that is so fun and will take uh, you out of your shell. And I I just challenge everybody to spread the word and in doing so, you'll be spreading inclusion across everybody. Uh, You know what? I got got enough. He's in charge. (laughs) We're done. This was good. Yeah, we're done here. Uh, the structure of this building has reached its capacity. Find your people, and if they make you feel sexy, even better. I found a picture of Blaze. Okay. Oh, no. Not not see. the Boy Scout picture. Nope. Just wait. Hold on. I'm gonna share. Maybe I can share my screen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's what he looked like. But this was actually uh, yeah, maybe costume. Maybe three years ago. That was part yeah. of. Uh, I didn't have that nice of clothes back then either. <laughs> <laughs> Growing up with a disability, I was always a spectator. You know, it's one thing to be a spectator, but it takes you to a whole nother level to be able to participate. Just because I'm disabled doesn't mean I don't have the right to run. I, I can't tell you how many people stop me all the time and go, you're a runner? Ainsley's Angels is a beautiful organization that gives disabled individuals the opportunity to run like others. We are called Angel Riders. The people behind us, they are lending us their legs so that we can do the race. And they're called our Angel Runners. Rider and runner, and together we shall get it done. It doesn't matter what kind of disability you have. We spread joy and love to everybody. It's just such a positive, supportive, loving atmosphere. It's something that's rarely found these days. My my wife Jessica and I, we do as many races as we can together. We're very competitive. The exhilaration I feel in the middle of a race in the sled is, it's a euphoria that I otherwise probably would have never experienced. I go fast. Sometimes I'll stay up all night just because I can't sleep, so I'm so excited. The feel of just moving at such a fast pace. It's sheer adrenaline. And then as you get closer and closer to the finish line and people are actually cheering you on and there are signs and yelling, it's like nothing I ever got to experience in my life. Being disabled, running, just means freedom. It just means acceptance and I can just be. So, yeah, you can just forget about everything just for a little while. If you want to run a race, hey, here's a chariot. Whether it's run, walk, go find a way. Anyone I see out and about around town, I'm like, you know about the angels yet?